Hi everyone, it's Taylor from TutorialEdge.net and in the next five minutes I'm going to be teaching you everything you need to know about context or your money back. So first of all, what is a context? Well, I like to think of them as buckets that have a little bit of extra functionality that allow you to do things like control cancellation through timeout and deadlines and also the ability to store key value pairs. So what tends to happen within your production applications is Let's consider this your application. Now, whenever somebody makes a request into your application, be it a HTTP request or a gRPC request, this request then hits the transport layer of our application. So this is the part of our code that handles that incoming request and then sends it on to the business layer. Now, this transport layer is typically the one that creates this context in the first place and then it will propagate it with things like a request ID or a trace ID which can be used thing for things like monitoring and observability. Now this context object that's created is then typically passed to the business layer or the application layer which will handle the business logic of your code. So this is where your application will actually do things like you know processing invoices, uh, creating comments or whatever you want within your application. So typically this is then propagated to that level or that layer. And then if your business layer then needs to talk to a data layer, such as, you know, Postgres, MySQL, this context is then again passed down to this data layer into the code that handles the insertion into the database or whatever. So why do we do this? Well, passing this with things like the request ID and the trace ID really helps us when it comes to monitoring what requests have failed. So imagine we have a UUID that's generated and one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, so on, so on. This is created at the point at which we get this request in and then it's sent throughout the different layers of our application. Now, if our business layer was to fail for any reason, you know, be it processing error or whatever, we could then log out in this business layer that the request ID has failed for one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now, not only are contexts good for propagating information between our layers of our application, they're also good for controlling things like timeouts and deadlines. Now, let's imagine we had a time sensitive application that had to return a response to our customers within two seconds, no matter what. So it could be a successful response or an error response. It has to return a response within that time frame. Now, we can effectively use context here to control how long certain parts of our code takes to execute and ensure that if it does exceed a certain timeline, uh, time frame or deadline, then we can return an error associated with that. Now, this is brilliant if you want to limit or reduce the amount of compute that is wasted by your application. So for example, if we have a server that takes in 100 requests a second, if 50 of them are going to time out, then we don't want to necessarily keep processing those requests after they've timed out because it doesn't help us at all. Like we can, immediately return a response to the customers at that point saying we've timed out and the remaining 50 uh, requests per second are then giving more or have more of a share of compute to then process the incoming requests. Now, not only that, but it also helps us to guard against some potential failure cases. Now, imagine you had hundreds of requests coming in per second and you didn't have a deadline or a timeout associated with your server. Now, if for any reason one or two of these requests every second does not return a response or somehow hangs for any reason, then suddenly you could find yourself with a growing number of connections being used by these long running requests and eventually your server becomes unable to handle any more incoming requests. Now, it's imperative that when you are configuring your production applications that you do set up sensible timeouts so that you're not woken up at three o'clock in the morning on a Saturday because of this issue. Okay, so we've covered what contexts are and how they can be useful. Let's start off by seeing how we can use them within our Go applications. Now I'm gonna import a few things. So I'm gonna import context and I'm gonna import FMT, FMT. Now I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna do FMT print line, go context tutorial. And we're going to create a new context. Now, in order to create a new context, we can do context.background. 
or we can do context.todo, which essentially return the same things. However, if you know what you're going to be using your context for, I tend to use dot background like so. Next, we can do something like context is equal to, let's say, enrich context. And we'll create a new function that will take in the context. And let's do func enrich context, context, context.context. .context. And this is going to return a context.context. .context. Cool. So just to quickly highlight, whenever you're working with contexts, it's best practice to have the context as the first argument within your function or method, and then all of the subsequent arguments after that. Okay, so let's enrich this context and create a new context. So what I'm going to do is context.with value. This is going to take in our, our original context, and then it's going to take in a key value pair. So I'm going to say request ID, for example, and I'm going to do one, two, three, four, five just for demonstration. Next, let's do something cool. So let's create another function. Do something cool. Again, this is going to take context.context .context as the first argument. And let's say we want to get the request ID. So our ID is equal to context.value. And then we can pass in the key that we want to retrieve from this context. And then we can print this out, our ID, like so. Now let's call this do something cool function down here and pass in the context object. Cool. So let's just cover what we've done here quickly. We've effectively taken in the original context and we've made a copy of this context using the with value method. And we've assigned this to our original context object here on line 20. Now we're then able to use this new context that will feature the request ID key value pair within subsequent function calls. Now let's go into the terminal and see if we can run this. Go run main.go. And as you can see, go context tutorial is printed out. And then when we hit the do something cool function, it then retrieves the request ID from our context and we can print that out. Now, at this point, it should be noted that whilst you certainly can use context to pass information between the layers of your application, you absolutely need to use this only for things that truly need to be propagated through. You shouldn't use context as a bucket for all your information. It's a supplementary object that you can store things like request IDs, for example, or trace IDs. Cool. So what about deadlines and using things like timeouts? Well. Within the context object, if we scroll up here, we can see that the context interface features a done channel. Now, this is the channel that we're going to use in order to control certain aspects of our code and ensure they time out in a manner that suits us. So let's navigate back to our do something cool function. And I'm going to do something that simulates a long running process. So I'm going to create a for loop and then I'm going to do a select statement. And the first case is going to be waiting for a read from context.done. And what I'm going to say here is fmt print line and timed out. And then I'm going to return from this function to ensure that it cancels this function. And below this, I'm going to create a default case. And I'm going to say fmt print line doing something cool. And then just so that my terminal isn't completely spammed with print statements, I'm going to do a time.sleep 500 times time dot, and we'll say millisecond. And remember to import the time package at the top here. And let's move this up here. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come down into the main function below. And we have the context.background object here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do context or cancel is equal to context. And I'm going to do with timeout. And I'm going to move the creation of the context into the first argument here. So context.background. And then I'm going to specify a timeout, which is going to be time. And we're going to do two 
times time dot second in this example. Cool. Next, I'm going to call defer cancel. Let's save that. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do go do something cool. So I'm going to effectively turn this into a go routine. And then below this, I'm going to do the following. So select, and I'm going to wait for the context.done channel to be written to. So context.done, FMT, print line, and let's do something like, oh no, I've exceeded the deadline. Cool. And then just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to do time.sleep, and let's do two times time.second, and save that. So let's cover exactly what this is going to do. So on line 30 here, we've created a new context and we've wrapped this with a deadline of two times time.seconds or two seconds. Now, whenever this time frame is exceeded, the done channel within the context object we've created is going to be closed and that will effectively allow us to cancel the execution of our do something cool function up here and it will return and we're also going to see the same down here. We're going to see case context.done is matched and it's going to print this out. So let's clear this and let's go into the terminal and do go run main.go and let's see this in action. Cool. So what we've effectively seen here is for every half a second, it's then defaulted to doing something cool. And we've seen that printed out four times. And then when the two second time frame is exceeded, we've then seen this being printed out as this case has been matched. And we've also seen this case matched as well. So that it's then printed timed out, which is then called return. And then the application that we're working with has then finished or terminated. Now, say for example, we want to do cancel our context sooner than the timeout. Well, what we could do is we could use this cancel function that we've got here. Now, in this example, I've deferred the cancel function to the end of the main function as I want, I've want. i wanted all of this code to execute without it being canceled prematurely. However, just to show an example, if I removed the defer statement and called cancel immediately, what we'd see is that the context would be immediately canceled for us. And as you can see, yep, oh no, I've exceeded the deadline which is down here, one, two, three, four, and it's timed out. So it's never actually able to process anything. The context was canceled before our application could do anything. Cool. So the final thing I want to cover is the errors. I know we've gone over the five minutes I said at the start, but there's a lot to cover in context and you're not paying for this. So I don't have to give you any money back. Cool. So let's have a look at this context object. And as you can see within the context interface on line 62 here, there is an error function here. Now the error function, if we call it and the done channel that we've talked about is not yet closed, then we don't receive any error. If this done channel is closed and we call error, then it's going to return an error that effectively tells us that the context has been canceled now let's see this in action. So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to say fmt.println context.error. I'm going to save this and we're going to rerun this application. So go run main.go. So it's doing something cool. And yes, context deadline exceeded, which has been printed out here. So the done channel has been closed on our context and this case has been matched. And then when we call this error function here, then it will print out that error for us. Now, just to tell you, or just to show you that I'm not lying, let's move this up here and we should see a nil statement getting printed out. I'm gonna clear this and run this again. And yes, when we call this before the done channel has been closed, a nil value is returned. Cool, so that is all we're gonna cover in this video. Now in this video, we've covered the basics of context, what they can be used for, and we've then looked at some examples of using context to do things like propagate values between our code using the with value function and also the dot value method here. 
And then we've also looked at how we can do things like implementing timeouts within our code. Now, if you liked this video and found it useful, then please let me know in the comment section down below and leave a like. And as always, please subscribe to my channel for more Go Programming content. Cheers.